condition without the gospel and what is man's fate without the gospel why do we need the gospel the gospel is a great mystery to many in his book to the Romans the great Apostle Paul provides clear answers to all of man's questions about God and about himself welcome to the HD gospel all right I'm gonna try not to make you guys cry <laughs> we've got a box here somewhere man I'm a little sniffly so bear with me um, let's get it over and done with already all right there we go not as good as the chicken and dumplings but it'll have to do um, why don't you guys grab your Bibles Grab your Bibles and let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 39. That's going to be our text for the night. If you don't have a Bible, go ahead and grab one of these yellow orange ones. And some of the verses that, that uh, I'm going to share with you tonight are going to be up there on the screen, at least the page number. Uh, the page number for that's there. Then you're going to see a, um, a slide that's going to have a bunch of verses on it. And, but there's no page number. And the reason being is because I'm going to be spending very little time. I'm just going to kind of quote them, but I'm not going to go there. It's not some long read. So it's just a, it's going to be a list. And what I would ask you to do, if you're a note taker, who I love, by the way, uh, write down the verses and then go back and check them later on. Okay? I, I want you to check them. And if I mess up, I want you to let me know about it. Is that cool? All right. Um, now, while you're going there, I want to ask a question. Over the last... Oh, a year or two. How many in the, in the room, in a show of hands, have uh, bought a car, a house, um, got a new job, or bought anything? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, okay? You have, okay. Um, when, you buy a, when you buy a car, do you, like you basically need a car because you need to get from one place to another, right? I mean, that's, the, that's, that's really what it is, right? But when you buy a car, unless you're absolutely going to buy a piece of junk hoopty like my car, you, you actually will go and you'll look at cars, and it's not just, um, sir, do you have something that goes from here to there? Like, you don't do that, right? You go in and you say, okay, I need a car, but you start looking at features and options, and you see all that it has, and you try to decide which one is the one for you. So it's based on all of the features of the vehicle. Same thing with the house. I mean, what is a house? Why do you have a house? I mean, let's, let's melt it down. You need a place to what? Sleep, eat, shower, right? I mean, that's basically what it comes down to, right? But when you buy a house, do you call up a realtor and you say, listen, I need a, a, a box, with the, a place that I can sleep, eat, and, and, and shower. Do you have one of those? Like, you didn't do that when you bought your house, did you? Like, you wouldn't do that. Now, uh, when you bought a product, like I bought this here the other day. This was for the church. We needed a new, like a, a DVD player for the computer back there, right? So when I, when I bought it, like, much like any other device, if you look on the back, it tells you what it includes. It's not just a DVD player, right? It actually tells you what's in there. It comes with a USB cord and this and that. Like, I didn't know if I was going to need a cord when I got this thing. But when I got it and I looked in the back, it says the contents of the box. It wasn't just a DVD player. It had other stuff with it. And so when we buy something, we know what we need, and we look at the stuff that it comes with, and that's how we choose which one to buy. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Now, the same holds true for your job. Why do you need a job? You need money, right? You need money. I mean, that's basically what it's for, right? I need some money, and so I get a job. So do you, do you, do you just like, okay, I've graduated high school. I, I need to make some money, and so I'm just going to get a job. Like, I don't care, or I've graduated college. I've got this degree, but I don't care what it is. I just need to go get a job. It doesn't matter what it is. Okay, I have, I have food to buy. I have electric to pay for. I have a rent that's due. It's this much, and I'll just take whatever job is out there, and that's it, and I don't care. How many people are going to go do that? Not usually. Sometimes when it's, when it's really a tough time and you just need to do what you can in the moment, that's fine. But generally speaking, you're going to go out, right, and you're going to say, okay, I need X amount of dollars, and I, but at the same time, I'm going to check and see some things. 
do I need to work on the weekends at this job? Because I'd really like weekends off. So, so do I, you know, I check to see what the work schedule is. What are they going to demand of me? Do I get paid vacations? Do I get health benefits? Do I get dental? Do I get time off for sick time or what? I mean, there's, what, what do we call it? They're, they're the bennies, right? They're the bennies of the job. So it's not just I need a job to make, you know, $30,000 a year is good for me. I'm good there and that's it. So I don't care what I do. I just need 30 grand a year. That's not going to cut it. When we go look for a job, we look for all that the job will give us. Would you agree? Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because I say that the, that the gospel is just like that. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just, okay, I need, I'm lost and I need to be saved. I'm in darkness and I need to be in light. That's not what it is. I know we've talked about this before, but I'm going to keep hammering it to you that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a one-shot deal that just says, I am lost, I need to be saved. You put your trust in Jesus, and he's perfect, and you're a sinner, and you can't get better on your own. You need his, his work on the cross so that you can have eternity with God. Like We understand that that's what it is, but that's not all that there is. That he's deposited some things into your life that are lasting for a lifetime, for eternity, and we need to cash in on those things. Some people believe that eternity starts the moment you die, and then it's going to be good, but in the meantime, I've been living in this hellhole called an earth, and it's just going to suck the whole way through. But see, the problem with that is the Bible. It's not a problem with me. The problem is the Bible. The problem is, is that Jesus said himself in John 10, 10 that he came not just to give you eternal life, that's why the Father sent him. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Okay, that's the here and now. And so he's deposited some things into your life that you can enjoy and cash in on now. Now, if you look at our text here in Romans chapter 8, and just kind of back it up a little bit, you see where we, we talked over the last few weeks about some of the things that, that God is going to do for you in the future. Like someday... The streets of gold and the, and, the, and the pearly gates and all that kind of good stuff. But he talks about that we're, we're free from the letter of the law. Like We don't have to necessarily do exactly what, the, what God's commands say to the, to the letter to be accepted and loved by him. That we just have to put our faith in Christ and the fact that he is perfect and he obeyed the law perfectly. And we put our faith in him and then that way we have the righteousness of God and we can be with him forever. So we're free from that. We're also free from our eternal destiny. Our eternal destiny. The moment that mom and dad conceived that I had sin in my life. It's passed down into my genes, right? And so I'm going to hell, man. That's just the way it is because we're all sinners. But our, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. So because we put our faith in Jesus, our eternal destiny has changed. But that still speaks of the future. We read in, a, in the text that we just uh, went through the last couple of weeks, it says that we're co-heirs with Christ that all the riches of glory that Jesus had are going to be for us as well. He's talking about in verse 18 of chapter 8, it says, yeah, we suffer now, but it's nothing compared to what the glory he'll reveal to us later. We're talking about eagerly waiting for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. It says that we're going to have freedom from death and decay. We're going to be released from sin and suffering. We're going to have full rights as his adopted children. And part of that is this new body, right? Amen to that, right? For all of us that have aches and pains, we get a new body. That we're going to die in this, this corruptible, nasty thing. And we're going to rise with a new body. Jesus Christ had, was flesh and bones when he resurrected. But he got to walk through walls too. Like who's looking forward? I'm looking forward to doing that. You know what I mean? That's going to be awesome. But that's still the future. That's still the future. Somehow, some way, uh, we're going we're gonna to see that. Like, I don't even understand how that's all going to unwind and how it's all going to happen. But someday, we're going to see all that. All of creation will see that there's no more decay and no more pain and no more tears and no more death and no more sin and no more suffering. It's going to be amazing. That's coming. And all creation will see that and all the effects of man's fall will never touch you again. It's going to be amazing. And we should, have, we should rejoice in that. However, 
However, as if that's not good enough, there's way more. And these are the ben- I want to give you two bennies tonight. Two benefits for being a Christian. Two benefits, okay? It's not just that someday you're going to be saved. Okay, I'm talking about right now. Now look here in the text, right? In our verses, it says here, in verse 26, it starts this, and, and. Now you got to stop there for a second, and you got to, what, what, is it, what do you mean and? Now pause, okay? Before we go back and unpack this whole and thing, let's, I want to read something. I want to read something with you. Is that cool? You guys ready to read? Okay, let's read this. Let's get the whole story, and then we'll go back, and we'll tear it apart. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us, us believers, in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory." Now what should we say about such wonderful things as these? It's like, he, he doesn't even understand. Like, how do you, how do you brag or, or, or gloat or, or appreciate all that we just shared a moment ago? That someday, like, all that you're going to have. Like, how do you even describe how good it is? Like, we've all gotten some good Christmas presents, right, in the past. And you could thank the person. You could describe what you got to a buddy on the phone, You could take some pictures about it and send it off as a text or something. But this stuff here, like how do you, how can you thank and appreciate the fact that you are an absolute sinner and like deserving nothing good, nothing, and in blatant rebellion to God who loves you and created you, he's like going to give you all the glory that his perfect son Jesus deserves. Like you get that. Like how can you even put that into words? is what Paul is saying here. And he goes on, he says, uh, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sit- seating in the place, I'm sorry, he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? Or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. Like that's a tough verse. We're going to talk about that in a minute. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. Now let's finish this up. And, am I, con- and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above, in, in the earth below, indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. I kind of lost my place there a minute. I'm sorry. So let's go back here. That's how he starts. He says, and. So the and is all that stuff you're going to get. The promises of God. That one day all pain and suffering and tears and sorrow and death are all going to be gone. And you get a new body, fully restored. And it's going to be happy times all the time. You know all the stuff that we complain about in this world? No more. Wouldn't that be awesome, right? 
No more school. No more bills. No more fighting. No more relational problems. No more stressing on how you're going to pay for stuff. No more need to share this amazing story about how seven grand shows up in your bank account because you don't need money. You have to be rocking cool to not need any money. That would be incredible. And it's coming. And. Really, God? Like that's not enough? And. You get more. He's into spoiling his kids. And. Now, this is the first one. And the Holy Spirit. Now before you go, oh, he's going to talk about the Holy Spirit. We don't have to talk about the Holy Spirit in this church. Let's, let's talk about the Holy Spirit, okay? Here's the, here's the deal with the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of confusion about the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the first benefit right here. But see, our nature is this. What will the Holy Spirit do? It's a Benny. What can you do for me? You go up looking for a job. You want to see what that job, that company is going to do for me, right? It's about me. Okay. Before we jump into what the Holy Spirit can do for you, Let's, 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 let's cut through the confusion of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is, is scary because back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you put the TV on, you see ladies with hair that looks like the chandelier, and they look like they're a circus clown with all the makeup on, and their husband has a comb over from hell. Let's just call it what it is, okay? It looks like an ocean wave, okay? And so you, get, and you see them doing all these crazy things, right? And they're, everyone's falling over and bam, be healed, you know. Like, whoa, I don't want to be healed. I like being hurt. I like being hurt. Don't touch me, you know. And then all these freaky things going on, right? Okay, and so we get scared about who the Holy Spirit is. Now, there's, in, in, in Christianity, I, I hate to even say this, but in Christianity, there's like two different tribes. There's the cessationists that say that some of the Holy Spirit's gifting, and we're going to talk about the gifts here tonight, some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, okay, I'm going to tell you what they are, prophecy, healing, and tongues, that they do not exist anymore, that once the original apostles kind of died off, that those gifts don't exist anymore because there's no need for them, okay? Then there's the continuationists. The continuationists say that all the gifts that we're going to read in 1 Corinthians 12 still exist to this very day, okay? I'm not a cessationist, and I'm not a continuationist. I'm a Christian, Okay, that's what I am. I don't know what you guys. I'm a Christian. Let me tell you what my belief system is. I believe that the, that the Bible teaches that when perfection comes, and if you look that up, it means face to face. When he comes again, we won't need those things. We won't need some of those gifts. But until we meet him face to face, they still exist. And so I believe that all the gifts that are listed in the Bible are still in existence today. Now, a lot of those things get abused, and so that's why the Holy Spirit is very, very spooky, right? Let's just, let's just face it. We've seen some crazy stuff in our days, okay? And so that's why it gets a little bit confusing, but I believe that the gifts continue on to this day. Now, we want to focus on who he is and not what he will do for you. So let's just do that for a second, okay? It says right here, it says, and the Holy Spirit. Now, before we see what he does, let's talk about who the Holy Spirit is, okay? And if you take notes, please, please write down these verses and check them out later. Okay. Here's the first thing about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, first and foremost, you get him, okay? You get him. Like, the, I, I can't, I, I'm, a, I'm a flawed, um, foolish man. I, I don't know how to fix cars. I don't know how to do, I, I don't know how to do a lot of things. So for me to, to, to stand before you and try to, to explain to you what you get in God, like, I can't do that, okay? So I'm just going to kind of do the best that I can with my own abilities to give to you what you get in the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit of God, okay? In Ephesians 1.13, it says that you get the Holy Spirit. It's deposit. He is deposited into you, living in you, God living in you at the moment of your conversion, so at the moment when you say yes to Jesus' work on the cross as your work on the cross, the Holy Spirit of God is deposited inside of you. He is no longer dwelling around and kind of mystical and you've got to pray to some far off God up in heaven. No, man, look inward. He's right here. He's right here. Like You don't need to pray to some far off God. The God of the universe right here. Okay, right here. Now, who is the Holy Spirit? Genesis 1-2 doesn't get much earlier than that, right? In Genesis 1, 
verse 2, you see that the Holy Spirit of God is, is just hovering over the nothing. Now, I don't even understand what that means. But he was hovering over the nothing, and then all of a sudden, here comes creation. So before creation, there's the Holy Spirit of God. What does that mean? He's an eternal being. And that eternal being that was there before anything existed lives inside of you, Wayne. That's crazy, right? He lives inside. He is eternal. Now, the Bible calls him many, many things. There's a word in Greek called paraclete. And it's in the Bible, when we translate English, he's known as the advocate. He's known as the comforter, the counselor, and the encourager. Why is he known by those things? Because those four things are four things that he does. Okay, And that's why he's called those things. They talk about what he does. He's referred to also in the scriptures by the Holy Spirit. He's referred to as the Holy Ghost. He's referred to as the Spirit, simply. He's referred to as the Spirit of God. And he's also referred to as the Spirit of Christ. Tim, you're gonna have to watch me tonight because I feel like walking. I can't, I can't sit still, okay? Um, so I apologize. Okay, here, okay, that's who he is, okay? And this is what he, this is, um, this is what he does. Because you've got to understand who the Holy Spirit is and what he does, because you can't just slap a tag on something freaky and call it the Holy Spirit, which is what happens sometimes, and that's what freaks us out for real. And the Spirit of God will never contradict the Word of God, and so the Word of God, which is inspired by the Spirit of God, tells us who he is and what he does. And so we have to look at what's happening and go, okay, does it fit this criteria? If it doesn't fit this criteria, I would say, hey, I'd, I'd be careful with it, okay? This is what the Holy Spirit does in Scripture. In John 14, 26, here comes all the verses, okay? In John 14, 26, it says that the Holy Spirit represents Jesus, okay? It repre- he represents Jesus Christ. It also says in John 15, 26, that he will testify, this Holy Spirit, all about Jesus, okay? It also says in John 16, 8, that he will convict the world of sin, now, what is sin? We talk about sin all the time, right? What is the sin? Drinking, smoking, lady chasing, cussing, cheating on your taxes, whatever it is, right? All these sins. And that's not it. Because the Bible goes on. If you read that verse, it says he convicts the world of sin. And what is that big sin that, that God's really concerned with? Refusing to believe in Jesus, right? Remember, God the Father said, you know these great works? You know what work I really want you to do? I want you to believe in the one whom I've sent. That's the big thing. Okay, so the Holy Spirit's job is to convict us, let us know that you need to believe in Jesus, and I'm going to teach you about Jesus. He's going to testify all about Jesus. In that same verse, John 16, 8, it says that he convicts not only of the world of sin, but he convicts us of the coming judgment, that someday the world will be judged according to this Jesus. You either believed and trusted him for your salvation, and you're in, or you didn't believe in him for your salvation, and you're out. That day's coming. It's a sense of urgency. Everyone who died yesterday had plans for today. And we all have to face that judgment someday. And so there's a sense of urgency. says, listen, you've got to believe in Jesus. You need to believe in Jesus now because you don't know when the end is coming. Okay, that's what the Holy Spirit will do. He goes on. It says here in John 16, 13, that he will guide believers. And not just everybody. He will guide believers into all truth. Okay, now here's the thing. The, Jesus said that he is the truth. He says that of himself. I am the truth. And so when the Holy Spirit is guiding you into truth, what does that mean? He's guiding you to who? To Jesus, right? He's testifying about Jesus. He's representing Jesus. He's telling the world to believe in Jesus, to tell the world to believe in Jesus right now. And he's teaching you all truth. See, truth, God is truth. Like, he's not just the standard of truth. He is is the truth you know what i'm saying like god is love like you can't truly love unless you have god in your heart like your love is based on someone loving you oh they're good to me i love them i like pizza i love pizza it's yummy i love pizza so everything that's good to us we in turn love it in return god is love right he's not and when he loved you it was not because you were so good to him because you were so yummy. No, you were so rotten, and he loves you anyway, right? He is love. 
Okay, so here's the thing. He teaches us about truth. He leads us to Jesus. He also says in 16, John 16, 13, that he tells of the future. A prophetic word. What's coming down the pike? Which leads us perfectly into this next verse. 2 Peter 1, 20, where it says that all the prophets, when you read the Bible, all this old stuff, back in the day, it says that these prophets spoke from God moved by the Spirit. See, the Spirit of God is moving these people to say these things about who? About the coming Jesus, right? About the coming Jesus. Here's, this is amazing. John 16, 14, go back and it says that the Holy Spirit only speaks what he receives from Jesus. He's not speaking on his own. Everything that comes out of the mouth of the Holy Spirit, that sm still small voice that you hear, Jesus is filling his lips and saying, say this about me, say this about me, say this about me, lead them to me. And he's sitting there with his open arms waiting to receive you. Everything that the Holy Spirit says is from the mouth of Jesus Christ. The central focus of all Scripture and the central focus of all of the universe is Jesus Christ the Lord. He is the center of all things. Okay, so the, the Scriptures, right, the, the Old Testament speaks of His coming. The Gospels speak of His life. And then the rest of the New Testament speaks of our proper response back to Jesus Everything is about Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself said to all the religious people who had their own idea of what God was, he said, listen, you search the scriptures day and night looking for eternal life, and all the while they point to me. He is the center of all the universe. He is the center of all of God's word, right? It's all about Jesus. And the reason why we as a church don't make biggest deal about the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit himself does not make a big deal of himself. He makes a big deal of the second person of the Trinity who is Jesus Christ the Lord. And that's who we make a big deal of here because that's what he makes a big deal of. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so that's what he does. Now here's, let's go on. In Acts chapter 4 verse 8, it says that the Holy Spirit gives us boldness to speak of Jesus. Now that story takes place um, way back when, when the church first started. Now this is what's happening. Peter and all the other disciples are watching what's happening with Jesus. They're following him for a couple years. Everything's going great. Then all of a sudden it just starts to go bad. And they grab Jesus and they lead him off to his arrest and his trial, right, which is a joke. But so, so the people that are there, they see all these folks that were hanging around Jesus. And they look over and they see Peter and they say, hey, Peter, Weren't, did, didn't you know that guy, Jesus? And, and, and what does Peter say? No, I don't, I, no, I don't know that guy. The scriptures say three times, the leader of the church, the, 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 the head, the lead pastor of the church says, I don't even know this Jesus, right? Totally petrified of what could happen. But now what happens is, Peter and all the rest of his, all the followers of Jesus, they watch as Jesus Christ is arrested, innocent man. And he's whipped and beaten and pulverized to death and he's stuck up onto a cross and he's buried dead. And then he rises again. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 4 verse 8 that Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit steps forward and looks at his opponents, the enemy in the eye, and says, this Jesus whom you killed is the only name under heaven and earth that someone could call on to be saved. Now he had just watched his beloved leader be destroyed and killed, but yet he empowered by the Holy Spirit, it says, to speak boldly the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And that's a ministry of the Holy Spirit because left to us ourselves, we'd be like Peter. I mean, if I watch someone that I love whipped, beaten, imprisoned, or killed because they did something, I'm not stupid, right? I'm not going to get up and go do the same thing again like they just did. That wouldn't make much sense in the natural. But when the Holy Spirit fills you, it just gives you that boldness to preach Jesus unafraid. This is what the Holy Spirit does. 
These are the things that the Holy Spirit does. This is who the Holy Spirit is. Okay? Now, he also does something else. He hands out gifts. Who likes good gifts? I love good gifts. For those of you that know who I'm talking about, thank you. I love good gifts. Thank you. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He hands out good gifts. Do me a favor and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's read them together. Now the Bible is very, very clear. Using Paul as the writer, he wants us to understand what the gifts are. He doesn't want this to be confusing or scary. And it doesn't have to be. Let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's, this is, remember, we're talking about what you get. You get the Holy Spirit. So we're just talking about what he does, who he is, as the other stuff's not good enough. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, let's start in verse 4. And let's read this. Because this confusion with the Holy Spirit's gifts, where they come from, how you get them. I, told, I had somebody tell me one time, yeah, if you want to speak in tongues, just start doing it. No. It's not the way it works. Read this. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but is the same God who does the work in all of us. And here we go. You ready? A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Some translations will say to build up the body, which is the church. So it's not given to you just for your own blessing. It's given to me to bless every, any ability that I have to possibly understand this book and pass it on to you for your education and growth is not a blessing just for me. It's I'm to use it to help you. And so any gift that's on this list that you receive, it's not just for you. It's for everyone else around you here. Do you understand? So it says this. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages. That's tongues. While another is given the ability to interpret that tongue, what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts he alone decides which gift each person should have. Now, before we jump into what my, my notes are going to tell you, okay, I want you, to, I want you to jump with me for a moment over to verse 29 of chapter 12. He's talking about these different gifts again. Some have had the gift of healing, some help, some leadership, unknown languages. And then he goes on, he says, now are all apostles? Question mark. Are all prophets? Question mark. Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the, the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. Okay, you, if, it, just because you want to speak in tongues, just because you want to be a prophet, that doesn't mean you go online and go find a prophet school, which they have, and sign up. Okay, that's not the way it works. It says that the one and only Spirit decides who and when. Not you, okay? You're not God. I got news for you. Newsflash, you're not God. You're not sovereign. You're not transcendent. I've been waiting to use that for weeks, Kelly. Transcendent. I love that word. Okay, so not everybody is going to have that gift. So you can't just pick and choose what you want. Okay, every one of those gifts are from the Spirit of God. And they're to be used to build up the body of Christ, to make it stronger, bigger, deeper, more powerful, more dynamic, more impacting into the community, into the nation. Okay, We can't just slap a tag, like I said, on some goofy thing and say, it's the Spirit of God and slap a tag on it because want to. You see it on TV. It's kind of freaky, okay? It's kind of freaky, and we can't just do that. Now, listen, 
The reason why I'm saying that, I want to talk to you for a moment about some. Some of these guys already know. Now, a couple weeks ago, we, we as a church family on Sunday night, some of us got together and we watched this movie called Holy Ghost. Anyone seen it? Raise your hand. Anyone? Come on, raise your hand. Raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. Okay, some of you saw it. Here's the, here's the thing with the movie, okay? This guy, I love the idea. It's great. And I believe that he's a wonderful man. He says, no script, no real money. I'm just going to pray. And wherever God leads me, I'm going to go there with my crew, and we're going to start filming and see what God's going to do. That's it. Okay, that's not going to work in Hollywood, but it'll work in the Christian genre. Okay? So he does that, and he starts praying. He does this team of people, and they go around the world, and they start just shooting stuff on film and seeing what God does. Now, there's some people that are, you know, I guess this, you know, they're getting healed. I don't know. I mean, it's a movie. I don't know. Um, and, and, and they go to the corn concert. Right? Anyone like corn here? The, the, not the vegetable, but the group, right? So they go to the corn concert, and before the concert starts, they're like, the, the band, that guy had like with the, the dreadlocks and the eyeliner and stuff, and, and, and they, they call everyone out. There's thousands of people. Hey, before the concert, anyone who wants to be prayed for, come on up here. And they're like praying for people at the corn concert. Right? It was awesome, right? That was incredible. And they prayed, and they go all around the world, and they jump on a, they, okay, we're supposed to go to this, we're supposed to go to, to um, Monte Carlo, I think is what it was, or something like that. So they get on a plane, and they go over there, and they're like, okay, we need to go in this boat. So they get on a boat, I had a vision about a boat, and I get on a boat, and then they go to this restaurant, they go to this restaurant, and they meet this lady, and they just start sharing the gospel with her, and she like, starts weeping and crying because it's exactly what she needed to hear in that moment so her faith in Jesus would be pumped up and built up, right? And they had to come across the earth to find this one lady at this one restaurant. It was exactly what she needed. Like, that's the work of the Holy Spirit to lead that woman into all truth, to draw her closer to Jesus Christ. Like, I'm, I love that part of the movie. That is incredible, right? But there's other stuff. Put your hands up. Remember that game we used to play? Like this, right? Remember that? Okay, so that's what they do with these people, right? They go up to these people and like, listen, the Holy Spirit's going to come here right now. You ready? You ready? You ready? Yeah. They're sitting there and they're putting their hands on the, on the, and this is what they did, right? And all of a sudden they're like, do you feel that? Do you feel that? And the guy's like, yeah, man, I feel some warm. And all of a sudden the guy goes, yeah, double it. Double it. More God. More God. Double it. What is this, Golden Corral? Like slapping on more potatoes or something? What is that? Like, you know what I'm saying? Meredith, double it. Double the potatoes. Double it. What, what, what is that? What, you know what I'm saying? Like slap the Holy Ghost on it. And you know what that does? It freaks us all out. The Bible is clear about the ministry and the person of the Holy Spirit. And unless something has a Holy Spirit tag on it that convicts people of sin, that convicts people of the coming judgment, that empowers them to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Unless it's pointing people to Jesus Christ, double it ain't doing that. You see what I'm saying? So unless it fits one of these, this uh, lack of a better word, categories, job description, person, whatever it is, of the, of the disclosed Holy Spirit in Scripture, that's not the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the Bible about himself. And so he's fully disclosed as to what he does and who he is. So we have to be careful. Do I think that he can do other things that I'm not aware of? Yes. But I don't know that it brings people to Jesus Christ. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So we have to be very, very careful. And I think that's why the Holy Spirit, when it comes up in church, can get very spooky and it freaks people out. And I have to admit, I've been freaked out. I didn't grow up in church. But I saw it on TV that, it's so goofy that Hollywood makes movies about it. Steve Martin and all that stuff, right? The, what is it, The Leap of Faith? I, I mean, Fletch is one of my favorite movies of all time. I think Fletch too. they did that. Like, they make fun of the church and the so-called working of the Holy Spirit. So silly. And so we have to be careful that we don't abuse who he is. He's the third person of the triune Godhead who was there hovering above the nothingness when the worlds were created. He's the third person of the Trinity. He's the Holy Spirit. Now that's who he is. 
But it says in our text, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. So now, finally, we got to, what does he do for me? What does the Holy Spirit do for me? The Holy Spirit, it says, that he prays and he pleads for the believer in harmony with God's very will for your life. Harmony meaning that when you get the singers up there, they all have a different voice, but when they sing together, it makes it beautiful because they complement each other. Do you understand? They're different, but they don't contradict. They complement one another. Do you get that? Okay? And so the Holy Spirit never contradicting that which the Father that you've never seen wants for your life, that third person of the Trinity is actually pleading on your behalf in the perfect will of the Father. This same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of you. That's a great amen spot. Thank you. Thank you. That same Spirit lives inside of you. So listen, the third person of the Trinity who is eternal who hears the words of Jesus and then speaks them to you to lead you to the Savior is pleading your case to the Father in heaven. That's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. Here's the second benefit. It says in our text that Jesus Christ is also pleading. It says in verse 34, who will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. So is, as if all the gifting that you're going to receive someday isn't good enough and you get the Holy Spirit who is eternal and he's pleading for you. He's speaking to the Father, pleading your case to bless you. It's almost like he's running interference because the Father wants good things for you and things are coming into your world to try to block you and the Holy Spirit's like coming between and blocking stuff, making sure that those things happen for you. You know what I'm saying? But it says here that Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, also is pleading for you. Now when it comes to salvation eternal, going from death to life, from darkness to light, it says in 1 Timothy 2.5 that there is only one mediator between God and all of humanity and it is the man Christ Jesus. We don't pray to Mary. We don't pray to the other saints. We don't pray and say, well, our grandpa's up there looking after us. No, he's not looking after you. Jesus Christ is looking after you. That's the only person who can bring you and God together. Do you understand? Okay, he's the only one. Now, who is Jesus? We find out who the Holy Spirit is that's pleading for you. Who is this Jesus Christ who's pleading for you? This is what the Bible says. Inspired by this Holy Spirit about Jesus to lead you to him so you know who he is completely. He is the visible image of the invisible God. No one has ever seen the Father and lived. He's a consuming fire. You would look at him and die instantly if you saw his perfect holiness. And so Jesus sends down a, visible, a visual aid so you know who God the Father is. Jesus even said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is the visible image of the invisible God. It says that he holds, the Bible says, that Jesus Christ holds all authority in heaven and on earth. He is the one who holds all of creation together so it doesn't explode. He is the one who will speak the words and all creation will end as we know it and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ was the creator, that all things were made by him and through him. This is the perfect son of God. And he was there before anything happened. Much like the Holy Spirit who was there hovering over the nothingness in the beginning, before anything, there was Jesus Christ the Lord. And he was with God and he was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the second person of the Trinity, the sinless, perfect Son of God, whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in. All of who God is was in the person of Jesus Christ. And he was, 
And he lived and he died and he was buried and he rose again. And now he, along with the Holy Spirit of God, the perfect Son of God, is pleading your case before the unseen Father. And remember this, Jesus, much like the Holy Spirit said, I don't say anything on my own. I say what Jesus tells me. Well, Jesus says that I never say anything on my own except what the Father tells me. Now, think about this for a second. So, so, so the Father tells Jesus, and Jesus tells the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit tells you, and it's just this big, amazing circle. So they're all together, one. Oh, the Trinity. How about that? I am the Lord God. There's one. Yes, all speaking. The Father says to Jesus, the Son. The Son says to the Spirit. The Spirit says back to God, the Father. Around and round and round it goes. The perfect will of the Father for your life. So the Spirit and the Son are pleading your case before the Eternal Father. So what happens now? Think about this, okay? You've got the Father in heaven. The control, the, 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 the dominating authority and power of all of creation, all of the universe, right? And here's the perfect, spotless, sinless, perfect Son praying to Him, pleading to Him on your behalf. And here's little old you, right? And you're praying your little guts out to Him too, right? And then over here is the, is the Holy Spirit of God, and he's praying his guts out to, to the Father as well for you. So all these three people, the Son, the Spirit, and you, you're all praying, Father, please help me with this. Right? So when you realize the power and the authority that's in place right there, and who's actually talking to God, what's your logical conclusion? Let me tell you what mine is. It's all good. Right? It's all good. Yeah. There I run into a problem because I, I'm thinking, okay, wait, Jesus Christ, the, the perfect one who took away the sin of the world, the creator, the, 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 the Holy Spirit of God who's hovering over the nothingness, like explain that, and they're pleading to the Father for me, and the Bible says that, that God the Father loves me as much as he loves Jesus, and I'm praying, so it should be all good, right? It's all good. But what I can't get out of my mind, and I don't know if I'm alone here, is what about, what about like strokes and cancer for Christians and car accidents? And what about like that stuff on TV now, like people are getting beheaded and stuff for being a Christian? And this has been happening for a long time, right? Go to the store, get DC Talks, Book of the Martyrs. People dying. But, but I'm thinking, well, it's all good, though. But I can't, for some reason, and I, I don't know if I'm alone, but I, don't, I can't get past the pain that I even experience in my own day-to-day. -day. Because when I think about the Spirit of God and the Son, this amazing one who has authority over all of heaven and all of earth, and he's pleading to the Father, things should be good for me, but yet... I got people, you know, my, but my friend Pat just passed, right? Pat died. You, got, you know what I'm saying? How, how does that happen? I mean, don't you think he was pleading for her? Don't you think Pat was praying? Yeah, right? How, how do you get past that? How do you get past the bad? Well, well look, look back. Remember I told you we were going to go back and, and, and focus on something. Look, look what it says here in verse 35. Read that with me. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? And here comes the freaky, the freaky verse. As the scriptures say, for, for your sake, for God's sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. So, so I'm... I'm reading that, but then I go to that mountaintop verse in this section of Scripture. Romans 8, 28, that says, all things are going to work for the, to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose for them. Like, is that good? I mean, we live in this world where we're pursuing good for ourselves, just trying to surround ourselves, buffer ourselves with good so the bad can't get to us. And I'm looking at this list, and I'm going, all the, like, we're dying for you? Like, that's, 
So when I, when I say all things are going to work out for the good, like in our own minds, separate, every one of us, right, we have our own idea of what good would be, how this tough situation is going to pan out, like this would be good. If it worked out like this, that would be good. Like we all impose that on the situation, right? Like it would be good if I had like an A in this class, that would be good. If I got this job, it would be good. If this woman liked me, it would be good. If I could get my hands on this job, it would be good. Maybe I need that keyboard, this guitar, that couch, that person, whatever it is, just name it. I, this would be good to me. If I got this problem in my life right now, fill in the blank, and if it worked out this way, that would be good. And you know what? Jessica, don't worry about it. All things are going to work out for the good. Like when someone comes up to you and they start quoting that scripture to you, that's annoying, isn't it? You're over there just like weeping and crying. You're bleeding out. All things are going to work out for the good. Whatever, dude. I mean, let's be honest. That's what we want to do sometimes, especially people from Jersey. They want to do that. So, 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 so maybe the problem is that we've kind of misused this little coffee cup verse of all things are going to work out for the good. Maybe we should... Stop putting what we think good is in the blank as the desired result to this problem because when it doesn't work out that way, you start questioning whether God loves you, hears you, or is even there. We need to get rid of that. We need to get rid of that. What does it say? Read the verse again slow. And this is why it's so important to read the scriptures. That's why I tell you to put it in front of your face. It says right here, Things are going to work out, right, to those who love God, sure, and are called according to his purpose for them. Okay, not yours. His purpose for them. You get it? Do you understand what I'm saying? That maybe your resolution Maybe your problem solver over here that you figured out, that's not what's supposed to happen for you. Maybe it's supposed to happen for someone else, but maybe not for you. So who's good? When it says all things are going to work out for the good, who's good are we talking about here? If Tim, if you have a problem, is it, is it to work out for Tim's good? No, 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 no. No, it's to work out for God's good. Do you see what I'm saying? There, all things are going to work out for the good to those who love the Lord, call to his purpose for them okay and see so the the quicker we get on that ship of realizing that it's for his good for the advancement of his kingdom not yours the quicker you're going to find some safe harbor the quicker you jump on that boat the quicker you're going to find the peace the shalom that god wants for you that peace with god where he says you have peace with god because of what jesus christ did, only until you realize that's for his good and his purposes for which you've been saved, not for yourself, not for yourself. Jesus Christ said, in this life, you will have trouble. Like, it's not always going to work out for the good according to what you think it's going to work out like. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says this, don't be surprised by the fiery trials you're going through. Don't be surprised by the fiery trials you're going through like it's a surprise to you. Like you don't know that this isn't going to happen. Have you read my book? It never worked out good for anybody. Don't be surprised. So verse 37. Things aren't always going to work out the way you think. They're going to be working out according to his purpose for you, but all these things happen. Danger, destitute, calamity, trouble, starved, persecuted, even killed. But does that mean he doesn't love us? Does that mean it's over? He says no. Despite all those things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Thank you. I got a text from Austin just now overwhelming victory. So what does that mean? That means, in, in, if I could just use my own words there to explain it to you, it means when eternity 
outweighs the here and now, there is peace. Do you understand what I'm saying? It, he's saying like, when these things come my way, when you start going down the list, I lost my job today, but I'm saved. I broke my phone today, can't talk to my buddies, but I'm saved. My girlfriend cheated on me today, but I'm saved. Fill in your blank, but, come on, fill in your blank, but, but I'm saved. And when you understand that, overwhelming victory is yours because nothing that happens gets in the way of that. Nothing else on this earth can get in the way with the end of the story that says, I'm going to be in glory with him forever. I'm ruling and reigning. We will judge the angels. We will judge people. We will rule and reign with Christ for eternity. Like That's the most important thing. And so though other things get in the way, you just blow them down. You just blow them down. Overwhelming victory is, is found in Christ. We have eternal life forever. All that future stuff that we talked about. All that stuff is coming no matter what happens here, no matter how bad it unwinds. When you go fishing with an open reel and it goes, it doesn't matter. Because I'm what? Because I'm saved. And just in case, I use a bait caster so it doesn't happen. Just in case. Okay, so now here's the difference. We got two, two verses here that are, that are similar but different. Okay, listen to this. This is, what I, this is why I want to say this. And that's a weird statement, but it's true about the future and whether you're separated from Christ and whether he loves you or not or whatever, okay? It says overwhelming victory is yours because you're saved no matter what. But it also says that it works out for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose. So no matter what the situation, no matter how bad the suffering, and no matter how long it lasts and how deep it is, Overwhelming victory is yours if you've said yes to Christ. Okay? That's not going anywhere. But things work out for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose. See, overwhelming victory is ours. If you're a Christian, overwhelming victory is yours. But called to his purpose for them, now that varies. That's different. Okay? That's way, way different. Let me finish up tonight with this. Let me tell you about a couple of different guys. The first guy, just a perfect illustration of, of, of the difference, the, the call to his purpose for that person. Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson is the starting quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks. Russell Wilson is, listen, great looking dude, built like a rock, Okay, loves Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, last year when they won, at halftime, previously recorded, him and his teammates that are also devout believers got uh, up on a stage and they interviewed with a, another pastor of the church in Seattle and they interviewed him with his other players and he shared his absolute obsession and love with Jesus Christ. He said that no, even being in the NFL, which is the height of his profession, you're like, you can't get any more. And even if we won the Super Bowl, he said, none of those things pale in comparison to being a Christ follower. That's what he said. So he used his platform, okay, to share the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. Now, if for, for the next four years, from 2015 on, four years, including his signing bonus, that man will make $70 million. Okay? $70 million, totally good looking, absolutely built like a rock, probably has a fat daddy house, Benz, Lexus, whatever he's got, right? Loaded, he's on TV, he won the Super Bowl, he's probably just got every privilege and benefit known to man on this earth. You know what I'm saying? Fame and fortune, right? And that was God's purpose for him. That's what God used him for. Like, I, I know that Mr. Tebow hasn't had that success with all the money and all stuff, but same thing. Good looking guy, everyone loves him. He's, you know what I'm saying? He's on TV. He's used for that. That was God, that, that worked out for the good for him according to God's purpose for Tim Tebow, for Russell Wilson. That's his, his purpose to advance the kingdom. 
Let me tell you about somebody else. His name is Jim Elliott. Now, Jim Elliott, let me, I, I have some notes here on my phone. Jim Elliott was a missionary. And Jim Elliott decided to go with um, four of his buddies, I think it was. And they, um, they found this tribe in Ecuador. And I don't know how to pronounce the name of the tribe. But they did some flybys because they wanted to, to evangelize these, these people groups. Let them know about Jesus so they could be saved, right? And so they get on planes and they find this tribe. Well, uh, back in January 8th, 1956, after flying over this tribe many, many times and dropping down goods to them to kind of like a peace offering, they decided to finally land. And the moment they hit the shore, the men from that tribe slaughtered them, dead. Now, these people have absolutely given their life to evangelize Jews for Jesus, right? Absolutely murdered instantly. Now, it wasn't in vain because their stubborn wives, to honor them and their love for Jesus, they continued. They continued to press in and press in and press in, and they never gave up. And inspired by what their husbands had done and laid down their lives, they continued to pursue this tribe. And to this day, the entire tribe has been evangelized. That's not Russell Wilson, is it? But, and they made a movie about it. It's called End of the Spear. You can rent it, watch it. Okay? But listen, all things are going to work out for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose for them. There's a massive chasm between the life of Russell Wilson and the life of Jim Elliott. But both are being used for God's purposes to advance the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. Some of you in this room are probably going, man, I would never do that because I don't want to get killed. But I, can, I know that there's people in this room right now that going, yeah, I want to go. I can't wait to go now. That it inspires you to go because you saw them lay down their life for something that was bigger than a part-time job at Denny's. That they want to lay their life down for something more than the accumulation of a nice car. And when I said, rich, 70 million, y'all go, amen? Fiddlesticks, dude, that's crap. That's nothing. And when I get rich, who cares if you're rich? You were made to make God known to the universe. That's why you were made. And when you jump on that ship, then you're being used for his purposes, no matter whether you are on TV for the Super Bowl saying Jesus is great with 70 million bucks in your bank, in your, in your bank or you die on the shores of Ecuador advancing the kingdom of God. Whatever it is, used for his purpose. That's why you live. That's why you live. I'm going to ask that the men are going to be handing out communion to come forward. We're going to take communion together as a family. We'll give it out here in a moment. But I want to just say this in closing. God is crazy about every single one of you. He's insanely in love with every single one of you. And so because he's insanely in love with you, he sends himself to pay the penalty of your sin. So you could spend eternity, whatever that is going to be, I know it's going to be better than this. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Amen. You get to spend eternity with him. Right? So he sends his son to pay the price for you. We're going to enjoy that. We're going to celebrate that here in a moment. But not only that, all that you get, no more sickness, no more death, no more tears, no more strife in any way. All that you ever wanted comes true. It's all good, right? And you get the Holy Spirit. And he gives you gifts to build up the body of Christ. Think about that. And then, as if that's not enough. Like, what can we say about such things? And it is just mind-blowing, right? But not only that, but the, the, the perfect spotless sin sinless son of God pleads to the father on your behalf and the Holy Spirit of God pleads to the father on your behalf that's all happening right now right now pleading to the father to make that way for you 
the best way for you. I just want you to think about that. And listen, just because they're doing it, don't, don't put your fix on the end of the problem. He's got a fix. He's got a problem solver for you. Let it pan out. Let it pan out, knowing that they're there every moment praying and pleading for you that it'll all work out for the good so that his kingdom is advanced. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this, uh, for this word. I thank you for this uh, wonderful group of people. And I'm, I'm fully convinced, Lord, that, that, uh, that these folks here, not only these folks here in this room, but those that are in the lounge there, that they, that they heard this and they receive this. And Lord, I believe that from this night on, that as a family, we will live with more peace because we know that you have our best interests at heart. We know, Lord, that the Son and the Spirit are pleading our case. That the three of you are just working things out for our good. And Lord, we don't know what that good looks like in every situation, but we know now that it's going to work out according to your purposes. Lord, I thank you for the testimonies tonight. I thank you for Lena and Meredith both for their willingness to cast away fear and stand here before your people and share what you have in their life. I thank you for those amazing miracles that, that you have poured out on our two families and therefore on this whole family. Thank you for that. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We look forward to singing some more songs to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>